Hi, I'm Jenny Rintoul from the University of the West of England in Bristol in the UK and this presentation comes out of my interest in the relationship between critical and contextual studies or CCS as I'll refer to it throughout the presentation and studio practice and my interest in different models of critical and contextual studies in art and design courses across UK art schools. So in UK art schools, CCS alludes to a curricular space commonly associated with writing, theory and critical thinking. And models of CCS differ from institution to institution and from course to course, ranging from isolated from making practices through to dispersed throughout the curriculum. Despite the varying models, there remains a mythologizing of CCS knowing as cerebral, disembodied and other to the tacit and material knowing of studio practice. And this myth is rooted in old Cartesian dualisms, that is the false binaries of writing versus making, theory versus practice and thinking versus doing. The myth has already been debunked and yet there is residue of it in art school curricula. I propose that the tension between these binaries opens a critical space for contemplation and resistance for more generative art school futures. And in the next 20 minutes, I will look at the formation of subject cultures, including some history of CCS and their contribution to tensions between current CCS and studio practice. I will then pause in a space between CCS and studio practice, so outside of subject cultural and institutional constraints and consider what pedagogical approaches emerge there with particular attention to rethinking writing practices and writing pedagogies. There are often still two dominant spaces in an art and design course. One is the making studio or workshop, um, and the other is the lecture theatre or an equivalent space which supports more of a transmission of knowledge to, in Foucault's terms, docile student bodies. And that kind of points to a colonial model of pedagogy. It's like a taproot style as opposed to the more rhizomatic style of um, thinking and learning and pedagogy in the studio. The lecture theatre and the studio each typically construct discrete learning cultures in terms of Leib and Wenger's ideas about situated learning and communities of practice. So far from being mere names of spaces, then the studio and the lecture theatre allude to ways of thinking, learning and organising knowledge. So part of the tension between CCS and studio practice emerges in this disconnect between the embodied knowing of creative practice and the disembodied lecture theatre setup of CCS. And then there was the disembodied online teaching experience in the coronavirus pandemic that some CCS provision has retained. So the body cropped into a bust and rendered in 2D is like the ultimate in disembodiment. The screen further distances and disembodies, reviving Rain's 2003 question, where is the I in CCS? But there's also some intimacy in the online teaching from home, a glimpse into the tutor's home, a tutor who maybe hasn't put on their full performance face or outfit because they know that the laptop camera is more forgiving than the spotlit lecture theatre. And moreover, online teaching enables writing in the chat bar, so from students who might not ordinarily participate, and writing is made visible and it's rhizomatic. There's the talk from the tutor, the student, the chat in the chat bar, and these things have potential to kind of cross over in a more kind of networked structure. So the move online during the coronavirus pandemic did reconfigure the CCS space in some ways, but I propose that the historical legacy of the lecture theatre exists beyond its physical site, um, especially when its knowledge codes are maintained through a formal essay assessment. So a CCS and studio disconnect remains even when CCS is moved out of the lecture theatre space. I find it useful to look to Ivor Goodson's work on the social construction of subject cultures as a way to think about constructed tensions between CCS and studio practice and to make a case for moving beyond these tensions into a more hopeful space. So Goodson says that subject cultures are in relationship with antecedent subject subcultures and antecedent subject subcultures refer to the historical legacy of the subject 
Um, and I think that there are two of these in an art and design course. There's the culture of CCS and the culture of studio, studio practice. So this is so it's really about the kind of internal workings of a, an art and design curriculum that I'm interested in. And those antecedent um, subject subcultures, according to Goodson, are historically made and reinforced over time by tutors, students and course leaders. So Goodson talks about staff and institutions reinforcing these cultures. And I propose that students are also part of the process, which makes the reculturing um, more possible. So how and why that culturing has occurred matters in order to unseat it. So I want to turn now to mentioning here the legacy of the cold stream reforms in England in the 1960s to give a bit of context to where the antecedent subject subcultures um, have been in CCS and the studio and where they are now. So the aftermath of the cold stream reports formalised the false theory practice binary and formalised theoretical studies, now CCS. The Coldstream reports are often blamed for the rifts between theory and practice and writing and making. And it was around the time of the Coldstream reports that a words and writing culture was developing in isolation from making culture. Uh, at this point, writing was being cultured into both art teacher training and artist training as a tool or a form um, of assessment rather than a practice. And so it was increasingly synonymous with assessment. The antecedent subject subculture of art and design is formed through these historical narratives that perpetuate this theory practice binary in which writing is other to making. And Goodson's view is that antecedent subject subcultures are socially formed and maintained by their participants. And this makes them useful to think about art school histories and futures. But the point here that I want to make is that the social formation is more powerful than the policy. And I find this a really hopeful position. I want to illustrate this in a bit more detail by looking more specifically at the impact of Coldstream on CCS by highlighting three of the unfounded legacies. So the first is the idea that in art schools, CCS is conflated with the essay assessment. This is often put down to recommendations in the Coldstream reforms in the 1960s. But Julia Lockhart in 2018 made a rereading of the Coldstream reports and she pointed out that there were no recommendations made for students to submit a written thesis or a dissertation in either of the Coldstream reports. The second unfounded legacy um, is this assumption that the Coldstream reports rendered CCS as a separate subject when in fact the first Coldstream report actually says we hope that the complementary studies will give scope for practising written and spoken English, whether this is studied as a separate subject or not. Um, kind of makes it sound a bit like a service provider, but that's a separate point. Um, the third unfounded legacy is the assumption that the cold stream reforms took CCS out of the studio and into a discrete teaching space like a lecture theatre. In fact, in a response to the first Cold Stream report, the Cold Stream Committee clarified, we have not taken this to mean that art studies are to be made to diverge in a scholastic direction or swamped by the atmosphere of the lecture room. So this makes clear then that the pedagogical authority of the lecture theatre, which Bourdieu and Passeron talk about, that is so key in forming the learning culture of CCS and that is a key part of the CCS studio tension is actually absent from the documents that were instrumental in the birth of CCS as separate from the studio. Assumptions about how to assess and deliver CCS then are products of a robust historical theory practice myth and of the power of subject cultures to uphold that myth through staff, student and institutional socialisation. And when you put it like that, that staff and students are socialised into subject cultures which are underpinned by historical legacy and that subject cultures are reproductions of powerful narratives that are produced and reproduced, it sounds like a colonial model, um, a structure that needs decolonising. <clears throat> and I wonder how we can support the unshackling of CCS studio relations from the constraints of their antecedent subject subcultures. I think one material for this process is writing. Um, and the idea of unlocking writing from CCS and enabling it to move between and through curricular spaces. So making writing as rhizomatic as practice um, and focusing on the idea that writing has a transdisciplinary capacity. 
A focus on writing also highlights another false binary, which is a, that of process and product. So writing is often framed as an end point or a product in art schools. Writing is a process, but the essay assessment is at the end. And one solution might be for taking written texts as beginnings, not end points. The processes of art practice are visible. They're even awarded in assessment and Orr and Bloxham talk about that in 2012. But the essay is associated with the outcome. So a question is how can we award process in the assessment of writing? A start might be to make it more visible. So the studio is often the visible area in an art school, the area where making and thinking happens. CCS is less visible because it takes place away from the studio or dispersed inside the studio to, to the extent that it's hidden or delivered in individual programmes so that it's hidden from outside of those programmes. And in all of those cases, often without the degree show visibility at the end of the course. Um, Another point is that there is messiness to making processes and that gives them visibility. Um, so one other solution could be to expose the messiness of writing. Some other thoughts that emerge from between the binaries that could be useful for rethinking CCS pedagogies in this space that we're in right now, um, kind of free from the time pressures of the institution um, within the limits of my presentation, include um, the idea of immediacy. So immediacy is valued in the current system, the idea of immediate results, immediate assessments, and this idea of always chasing time. And I wonder whether there's scope to prioritise a being in the moment. So like immediacy, but without the rush and the exhaustion, and as part of something slower and generative, which is perhaps unlikely to neatly end at a prescribed point and unlikely to focus on the output, although the output might be a consequence. So for students in CCS, this might mean not forcing CCS to immediately connect with studio practice. I've written elsewhere about the idea of CCS and studio practice coming together or integrating at unpredictable points, beyond assessment points and even beyond the degree programme. And, um, and I advocate that. And this is part of a slower approach to teaching and learning. And Berg and Sieber talk about the culture of speed in the academy. Um, and they propose adopting the principles of slow to our professional practice. They think about this in the context of the slow food movement, which I think also evokes the local, so not the standardised, and evokes ontologies of care. And I wonder if we can use this to think about subject cultures and pedagogies. So in their discussion on the slow movement, Berg and Sieber make a case for pleasure. They talk about a pedagogy of pleasure. They aren't talking about pleasure in a hedonistic sense. They're talking about pleasure in, in antithesis to increasing expectations of productivities, productivity in HEIs, higher education institutions. And I wonder whether there is a way to combine their sense of pleasure with care, which, as I suggested, is also part of the slow movement, and a being in the moment, a kind of flow. And I wonder if that might look like a pedagogy of joy um, as part of the politics of care and hope and resistance. And that resistance might also look like shifting away from productivity and towards generation. So the product, the outcome is associated with accumulating knowledge, the known, the immediacy that I've mentioned, and the pressure on increasing productivity. To be generative rather than productive is to operate in a space of not knowing in process. It's more creative perhaps and less output driven, but that's not to say that it doesn't lead to outputs. And this has resonance with Berg and Sieber's proposal to shift away from the product, like the book, the article, um, to the process of developing understanding, which they also say is likely to result in books and articles. So this is a less predictable and a more unknown space than a productivity driven space. And that not knowing is familiar in art school practices. So taking this art school not knowing as an approach to pedagogy looks like an anti-transmission model, um, anti-colonial model, so anti kind of being seeped in power. And this isn't just an issue for our field. So Schick and Timperley in their book that published in 2002, Subversive Pedagogies, is about the pedagogies in the university sector more broadly. And they talk about embodied pedagogies, uncertain pedagogies, pedagogies of emergence. Um, and so on. So there's broader reach for this discussion on art school pedagogies. So 
writing practices in the art school, when they are reduced to the academic essay, have been associated with order and knowing, which in turn have been associated with CCS. Distance from the studio, distance from studio practice. Not that there is anything outmoded about the essay, by the way, um, but just that there are other possibilities for writing. Um, and I think the space between CCS and the studio, the space we're in now, helps us to think that through. Rather than supporting neat binary structures, I wonder whether writing practices can make for more ambiguity, not in the sense of the impenetrable, but in the sense of the unknown. Um, and I want to draw on the zombie metaphor here. So Whelan, Walker and Moore in their book Zombies in the Academy from 2013 use the zombie metaphor of living and dead for overcoming Cartesian dualism. And in that book, Harper um, says the zombie has the capacity to release us from that dualistic thinking, from that kind of either or thinking. Is this something that writing can do by being reframed as a transdisciplinary material, um, a transdisciplinary material practice that emerges from the tension between CCS and studio practice? Also on the zombie metaphor, zombies are slow, connecting to the earlier discussion on the slow movement. And finally, Dayland and Adamson talk about a zombie solidarity as a combination of collectivity and resistance. And I wonder whether that's something that can be developed as well. So I was thinking about the very last series of The Walking Dead. So The Walking Dead ended in uh, 2021. And at the end of that last series, there was a brand new breed of zombies that emerged that appeared to be more sentient and more animated um, they could climb, they could problem solve. So unseating binary myths, um, particularly the binary of living and dead, but also unseating the zombie myths. So thinking about zombies as a metaphor for unseating that writing, making binary, that theory, practice binary, emerging through that space between um, CCS and studio practice. So... The critical space that opens up between CCS and studio practice unseats the myth of writing as solitary and impenetrable. And that's in common with the myth of the artist genius. I propose broadening the forms of writing with which students engage um, and where they experience them, and particularly um, undoing the idea of writing as an endpoint and a product. I propose taking the pressure off writing um, and off making as ends in themselves, so that writing and making, making are practices on the journey of an idea. And thinking about writing as a material process. So here we are in this space opened up by subject tensions and not restricted by subject cultures or the antecedent subject subcultures. Um, so we might look elsewhere from this space, for example, to creative writing. What can we borrow from other subject cultures? Um, and the space that we have thought from in this presentation is rhizomatic, so ambiguous as well as messy, with offshoots in unknown directions, it's generative, and I am going to muse here for a little longer. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>